Thanks for that piece of shit, Lieutenant, that's always uh, on his podcast. Bash us. F*** him. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank our supporters out there that actually make contact uh, comments on YouTube. And we actually appreciate it because we've had some mic issues. We've had some Wi-Fi issues that we had to troubleshoot. So it looks like we're actually at a point where we could actually move forward and could possibly hear us clearly. So we appreciate it. Positive comments, negative comments. Feedback is important. So listen, let's get right into it. Let's talk about Donald Trump. I mean, it's this is insane what's going on in this country. He's the first American president to be convicted of a felon. But what's interesting is the title to this episode. Is he the first to be convicted of a felony in New York City for 2024? John, what are your thoughts? I don't know if it is or if it isn't, but I've been looking it up because I heard it. I looked it up. I ran it through AI. I ran it through a bunch of checks and nobody's giving me an answer on it. It's like, oh, it's really hard to tell for the convictions, blah, 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 blah. But I put it out on Twitter, and, and someone sent the the stats for DA Alvin Bragg. So I run the 2024 stats for felony convictions. What comes back is zero, right? So obviously, it's not updated because we know that there's one. So it's kind of making sense. And then another thing I heard, which I don't know if it's true or if it isn't, another thing AI wouldn't give me an answer to. I couldn't really find it. And even if it's not true, I'm sure he's one of a very few people. Donald Trump, this is the stat. And again, I'm not saying that this is true or not, but it's this is what I heard. Donald Trump is the first American over the age of 75 without a previous criminal record to be convicted of a felony, a nonviolent felony charge. Listen, the bottom line is this. And I think this is what's important to note about this conversation is we don't have the actual data in front of us. But the fact that we can actually have this conversation just alludes to the problem that's going on in New York City and the entire country. That we could actually have this conversation. Is he actually the first felony conviction for 2024? We're almost halfway into the year. So it just shows the state that the country uh, is in, the state of events, the state of affairs when it comes to politics, the standard of justice. Because what is the standard of justice anymore? It appears that anyone's on the conservative side of law gets a different standard we're talking about donald trump but in regards to donald trump it was also another incident where a police officer from newark new jersey was sentenced to 27 years a 27 year sentence where a wild police chase ended up in the death of an adversary and also someone else shot now what's interesting about this case is this police officer was held to some standard that we've never seen before but why are we not yes did it end in tragic absolutely but the, this is the byproduct when you evade police. Why are we not holding those accountable that evade from the police? And that's the new standard. That is the new standard. Criminals are, are just victims of society. And those who go against your political ideology, this is a Marxist, this is a Marxist ideology. This is a Marxist takeover of New York City and potentially the entire country. Um, and what their what their ideology are is criminals are just victims of society. It's the polit it's the political opponents that are the ones that could never be reformed. It's the political opponents that are the most dangerous people to society. Because what do we see in Stalin's Russia? We saw the rapists and the murderers. They were the prison guards. They became the prison guards. They opened up the jails. Sounds very familiar, right? 2020, we opened up all the jails, right? So they made the victims of society, the prison guards, and they threw people who were countrymen who just were on opposite sides of a political ideology. One, by the way, that they were right because communist Russia fell. Their political ideology was insanity. It was murderous. And this is eventually where Marxism leads. It leads down that path. And I find it funny when I wake up the day after Donald Trump's convicted and I hear how he's a felon, how he's a criminal, all of a sudden it's OK to call somebody a felon and a criminal when for the last four years I've been hearing that they're justice involved individuals. So to me, Donald Trump is not a convicted felon or a criminal seeking to be the president of the United States. He's a justice involved individual seeking employment. <laughs> it's interesting you put that spin on it because it's exactly true. But it's also interesting. I was saying to myself, you know what? If I was Donald Trump, 
would I be sitting there saying to myself, was this all worth it? And if he's actually saying that to himself, then he really is a true patriot, a true countryman. But he also, he has to be asking himself at this point, I was a billionaire. I was liked by all these people in Hollywood. I was a, a, I was a, an iconic figure in, for this country, right? He was a celebrity businessman. He, he embodied both. He was loved by the same people that are on the attack right now. So I'm just curious because, listen, at the end of the day, he's still a man. And he, I mean, he has a family. And he has to be sitting there saying to himself, was this worth it? Because if he never stepped into this political arena, he would not be where he, he would be today. He'd probably be on the beach somewhere in Mar-a-Lago. He'd probably be enjoying himself. He would not be the the butt end of a joke, or he would not be sought out for political persecution. So I'm sure those questions have pondered in his head. He's human. He has to be thinking that. I mean, listen, great people. In order to be remembered, you're going to make sacrifices and you're going to make sacrifices that you're never going to get a pat on the back in this earth floor. You're never no one's ever going to acknowledge it. If you look at our founding fathers, you look at the men who signed the Declaration of Independence. It's funny because I. it's funny that you bring that up, Eric, because I had put that post out two years ago, two days ago, and it was a post about the founding fathers and it's a video. And it shows the sacrifices these men made. And we're not taught about it in school. We're not taught that they were all bankrupt. Their families were chased out of their towns. They lost their houses. Their, their, they were burned. Their good names were destroyed. And they did it all to create a, a nation, a nation of free men. They, they gave up everything and they got and, and most of them used their entire money. These were wealthy guys. These weren't farmers. These weren't I mean, some of them owned farms, but they were the wealthy people. They weren't people like me and you or just a regular cop on the beat. They were high ranking people in society. They had a lot of money and they used their own money to form this nation. And this nation never paid them a dollar back. And honestly, other than people seeing their signatures on the Declaration of the Independence, I'm sure very few people know the history of that. But, you know, you're either going to give that up for what you believe in to have a free nation. We're either going to have people that sacrifice those things. They put God and country before themselves or we're not going to have a nation. And that's what Ronald Reagan had stated over and over again. Freedom is no more is no more than one generation away from using it. And if we're the generation that's not willing to sacrifice because we had it too easy, then we are going to lose freedom in this country. Absolutely. I think you nailed it right there. It's, it's absolutely true. You know, I was actually a history major in college. And uh, to define history, you see that everyone essentially has to become some form of martyr to actually be remembered for their story to be understood. Even a story like Rosa Parks, right? She had to go through extreme controversy, right? She had to be in a position where she was actually looked upon as, <clears throat> as the, uh, as the outcast. And at this point, I think Donald Trump for a, for a portion of this country is the outcast and his people cheering. But I also believe that it's going to be the generations moving forward, families of these same people that one day will look back and say, you know what? Donald Trump was actually an icon in this country. Why? Because Donald Trump right now, whether you like him or not, if you're actually in, in opposition or if you're in favor of Donald Trump, you have to be saying to yourself, could this be me? What if you find yourself in the opposition of some political arena? What if you find yourself in the opposition of your employment? What if you find yourself in opposition of a mandate? What if you find yourself in opposition of, of some form of employment rights and you speak out against that? What if you are that person? Could you be Donald Trump? So you have to be asking yourself these things because I think no longer is this just about Democrat and Republican or left and right. This has become at a point well. Do you fall in line with these Marxist ideology? Or are you in opposition? Because if you're in opposition, you could be the next 75-year-old man that actually has a felony. And that's that's where we, we, we are at at this point in this country right now. So I no longer do I think if you are a Democrat, could you sit there and say, you know what? Well, he's a Democrat. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. He's a Republican. He's got conservative views. But guess what? You're a Democrat, but you might have views – that are in opposition of some form of employment or somewhere else in a, in a facet in your life. And you could be 
under political persecution, or you might find yourself in a different political arena, and you might find yourself behind bars. Well, I mean, I you know, it's it's all that's possible. You know, you could potentially be someone that that meets the hangman's rope too. But my thing is this: if you're not speaking out against it, if you're not willing to stand on the line, then you side with the Marxist. You side. You're for all of it. Oh, I have a family. I might do this. I have kids. They might do that. Okay. You have kids and you have a family. That's exactly why you should be speaking up so that your children grow up in the same country that you grew up in and have freedom of speech and have freedom to move throughout social classes and, and, and have the life that you were given that people sacrifice for you. And I just think this generation, this is the generation of cops who don't want to arrest people. This is the generation of cops who I don't want to go out and do anything because CCRB or the DAs don't do anything. And I'm not knocking the cops here. You could bring that through all of society. Oh, well, I can't help the woman that's being raped because I could get sued. I could get arrested. I can't help the old lady crossing the street because she might accuse me of something. You know, all of these things. And we've been taught to be complete, utter cowards. This, our generation has been taught we our, our, we always say the police department has been emasculated. Our entire generation and every generation after us has been me, emasculated. And we've been taught to not be men. We've been taught to not stand up in the way of things that we know are clearly wrong. Listen, I have friends that are damn mad about the trans movement, the, the mandates, the, the thing that's going on in sports that we're putting men to go against their daughters. They won't say a word about it. They won't say, so I'm like, you're not against it, dude. I'm sorry. You're not against it. You support it. You sitting there in cowardice and not saying a word because of what may happen to you is support of it. You're just hoping that alligator comes for you last. That's all it is. But eventually it's coming for you. Well, I'm glad that you said that because sometimes I ask myself, and you know, what line does everyone have? And I do believe that everyone should have a boundary and a line. At some point, you have to say, well, wait a minute. This is too far for me, and I have to take a stand at this point. So, for instance, myself, and I know for John, we both agreed that him standing up you know, for his religious beliefs in opposition to the mandate, and myself standing in opposition to the Civilian Complaint Review Board, which is completely in opposition of intrusive police work, which is tearing down – police officers, good police officers that are out there right now that understand intrusive police work that's just totally destroying their record. And we're going to go into that also later and what's happening in Boston right now. So something that we see spreading through the entire country that just completely takes away from intrusive police work and hurts the police officers because those are the only ones that held accountable. But ultimately, what's going on is you have to stand up for, at some point, you have to say to yourself, I, at least I said for myself, you know what? John and I are doing this podcast we're going to give our critical opinion based on anecdotal experience. We're going to give some factual data. Some stuff may be sexy. People may be interested. And some stuff people may just find you know, in complete opposition, and they may not like what we say. And if that means that I'm going to go broke or possibly end up in jail, I'm willing to do it. And I know John is also because this is the boundary. This is the line that we hit that we have to stand up because if not, we are cowards. And I can tell you this. I'm not afraid of going broke. I've been broke. I've had money. I could bounce back. And so could you. And I'm not afraid to go to jail for something I believe in. And I hope that's maybe what Donald Trump believes at this point. Because if we don't stand up, what is going to happen to our kids? That's our legacy. And our kids have to know that someone has to stand up for them. So that one day, if history repeats itself, if we get back to where we need to be, our children need the same mental fortitude. We need to get back to that masculine society where we believe in power and we believe in strength. And it doesn't mean man and woman. That means masculine traits. And that's for the entire country. That's for the entire world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the the insanity of Donald Trump is it's it's mind boggling to me. It's com the dude was absolutely loved by Hollywood by the Democratic elite in New York, by New York City. He was the king, bro. Everybody loved Donald Trump until he said, I want to run for president. He became the most vile, hated man. You know, so today, Jamani Williams and a lot of outspoken advocates are going after Donald Trump 
because of his statements about the Central Park Five. Youssef Salam, who is the chair of the Public Safety Committee in New York City uh, Council, was a member of the Central Park Five. So there were a lot of things that went wrong during that investigation. They were underage. They were interrogated, not being on video. They were interrogated without their parents. But Youssef Salam admitted to the police, not on tape, he admitted to the police that he cracked a woman who was raped in the head with a pipe. Now, was he coerced? I don't know. But that's what the police said. They And, and they all admitted to multiple crimes that night, including, including being there. But none of them admitted to actually raping the woman. So, sent, so Donald Trump at the time had said he said that they should see they should seek the death penalty for them, and he never backed off of that situation. So, Jamani Williams and all of them are saying, "Oh, look at this! The 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 pots on the kettle. Who's calling the kettle black?" And Jamani Williams posts this today: "If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed." And loving the people who are doing the oppressing. But Jamani Williams is short-sighted in, in even posting that quote. So I posted another quote to him. And this, to me, spells out Donald Trump to a T. And it's also a Malcolm X quote. And it's, the media's the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and make the guilty innocent. And that's the power because they control the mind of the masses. So not only did they paint the Central Park Five as they were rapists and murderers or attempted murderers, and then they painted them as innocent victims of the uh, of society. Donald Trump, they painted as a love adored individual of society, and now he's one of the most hated people in society. So I believe my quote of of Malcolm X was the actual correct one. That this is what we're seeing, the, these two dichotomies of these two separate incidents and that's how powerful the media is. Listen, that's why I totally agree with you. Absolutely, I agree 100%. And that's why I've always said I I, I really believe this. I think that the media in itself, news or any type of journalism at this point, especially at this this clinical point this climatical point that we are in this country, it's become religion. And it's not a matter of, of truth anymore. You know, if I if I have certain ideology, I watch, I watch CNN. If I have certain ideology, I watch Fox News. Or maybe it's Newsmax. Or maybe it's some other form of journalism, and it's what you believe. And I think that you're 100% right. The media can spin it any way they want. So, you know, it, it, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to be in that in that? focal point of media. And I, I, I will say this, when it comes to Youssef Salam, if he really believes that he's a community advocate and he's serving the people as a council person, I think it would be a great opportunity to say, listen, I went through an, a horrible experience with the police system. I was young. You know, maybe I did commit some heinous acts. I was mischievous. But the, here's the value in it. Here's what I learned from it. And this is the value that I learned that I want to bring forward for the people so this doesn't happen to them again. At the same time saying that, you know what? The police is a necessity. The public is a necessity, and we have to bring them together. Even myself, being attacked by an overzealous civilian complaint review board, my public record has been just completely deteriorated, and it's just atrocious when you look at it without any context. However, I have not said there should be an abolishment of a civilian complaint review board. What I've said is we need to change it we need to make it fair and equitable because it's necessary it's a good thing but how it's utilized and who encompasses it right now is just has a complete disdain for police so it's just completely biased so i'm saying that we need changes but we don't need to completely abolish it i don't have any vengeance in it and i do believe if you have vengeance that not you know when you show revenge you don't just dig one grave now you're digging two graves so there's no i'm not seeking revenge or seeking vengeance I'm seeking the value in it to make things better. And that's what I would hope from Youssef Salam. But that's not what we're seeing here. What we're seeing here is just a complete attack on the police. And I see him, it's almost like he gets his kicks now. And it's his chance to get back. And that's not the value we need. That's not true leadership. Even though you've been through hardship, use that hardship to move forward to make you and everyone else better. I just find it funny that he's saying that Donald Trump should now never be the president because he's a convicted felon when by all means it's almost a certainty that maybe Yusef Salam's not a convicted felon but he has certainly committed violent felonies 
as opposed to Donald Trump, who has committed a nonviolent felony. So if Donald Trump shouldn't be the president, you should step down from your seat, sir. You should step down from all the wiling you did in Central Park when you would run around with 30 people and beat women up and rob people. So you should step down then, sir, too. Right. Because if we're going to hold if we, if we want perfect people in government, wipe the floors clean, get rid of the Republicans, get rid of the Democrats, because I don't know. And I don't know anyone who's going to take them. We're going to have to put innocent children in there. And by the time they hit six or seven, they're not going to be perfect anymore. So, I mean, I'm not I, I'm still I'm still voting Trump. I could care less at this point. I think he's the only clear candidate. Does Donald Trump go to jail? You know, what's interesting about this, I remember years ago. I'm not sure if you if you heard this yourself, John, but I remember Bernie Kerrick was speaking out, <clears throat> and he had said on numerous uh, on numerous news channels, he had said that every day Americans themselves are committing numerous felonies and they just don't know it, and that if 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 there if there was a chance to have an attack on your political ideology, that you easily can be convicted of a felony and i remember i kind of glazed over it you know i, I always i always thought I, I i always held bernie kerrick in high esteem uh i know there's been comparisons with him and kaz daughtry but i i don't see the comparisons i think that bernie kerrick is uh you know is an intelligent man i think he's he's done a great job in the military and i, sh I think he showed some value leadership and he's been a, a great spokesman for the police community but what he said it, it, it never resonated it just kind of glazed over and i said you know what I'm sure at this time he's probably saying this because what happened to him. But as we move forward, I said, you know what? It, it came back to me. I thought about that. I said, you know what? He's right. We have to ask ourselves, at any point, if we are held to political persecution, could we be convicted of a felony? Because what Bernard Kerrick said is that every day we unknowingly commit felonies. They're just not seeking it out. So at any point, they could say, you know what? We don't like the finest unfiltered. John McCarry and Eric Dimney committed some felony by something they spoke at. And you have to ask yourself, could that be you? If you find yourself on the opposite end of political persecution, could you find yourself? So it doesn't matter at this point, Democrat, Republican, conservative, leftist. Right now, what we need is we need to be we need to get back to that salt of the earth America. And I say that all the time because. You know, I think about these old commercials, what really defined America. You see the, the man pulling up to his house. His wife and kids are at the door. He pulls up with that pickup truck. He's taking stuff out of his truck. And you have the American flag there. Or, you know, it's ha in, a, in a metropolis. You know, somebody takes a subway home is, and uh, gets to the apartment and his family's there. That's salt of the earth America, the land of the free. But no longer do we see that. You know, John put a tweet out about the comparison with the Marxist ideology and comparing Russia. And, and you know what? It's it, Some may laugh at it, but if you actually look at it and you read it, we are there. We are there. And John, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. We have now a living in a Marxist society. Show me the man. I'll show you the crime. There was a book out. It's called Seven Felonies a Day. Americans commit seven felonies a day and they just don't know it. And so that's, I believe that's what Bernie, I didn't hear Bernie Kerrick say it, but that's more than likely what he was referencing when he said it. Um, he was probably referencing that book. It was out, I believe over a decade ago. Um, and yeah, so that's, but that's what Stalin did. Show me the man and I'll show you the crime. So, and that's what happened to Donald Trump, right? Why was this accounting error, these accounting errors, why would this come to any attention of law enforcement or a district attorney, especially a district attorney who ran on, I'm going to convict Donald Trump, especially the fact that our own Department of Justice, the, the, the preceding district attorney said that this is not a case, there's nothing here, and they needed to reach all of these elements to make it a felony. So you still didn't answer my question, Eric. Do you think Donald Trump's going to jail? I, you know, you know what's funny. I'm glad that you you uh, you asked that. So we just we um, with this podcast we do X spaces quite often, where we meet with different people and, and people talk about different ideology. We talk about different subjects. Talk about law and order. And obviously, we've been talking about Donald Trump. That's been uh, that's been at the height right now. And I can say this: I was betting my money. I was say I I was hell bent. I said that we are going to have a hung jury. I really believe that because I said to myself. Even at this point, 
with this, this, this the hatred towards Donald Trump, this political persecution, this George Soros funded justice system that has brought the arm against Donald Trump, that this is still America. I still had hope that there was good versus evil. I still had hope that there would be people on this jury who said, wait a minute, we have gone too far. And I was putting my money on the hung jury. But after seeing that he was actually convicted, I do believe he's going to jail. I do. I agree with you. I mean, I, I've, I've done so many X spaces with people that, uh, you know, whatever you want to call them in society, they're pretty up there in, in the right wing culture. They're very close to Trump. And, you know, Eric's done it. Sal's done it. And I hear a lot of people saying he's not going to jail. It's going to be a logistical nightmare. They do not care. Even if they put him in jail for a day, they want that photo. Donald Trump, in my opinion, is going to jail. They are going to Eric Adams was more than happy to let everyone know that Rikers is ready. He can't he can't contain the prisoners that are in there now. I mean, they're they're getting drugs, they're dying, they're killing themselves. He can't control what happens inside of four walls in a controlled environment where people lose most of their constitutional rights. He can't control that environment. But he's you know, he's sitting there patting himself on the back about what's going on in the city when again we still have Marxist agitators running around screaming pro Hamas things, destroying property, assaulting police officers. And again, their funders and the organizers of these events are held to no standard. They're not even charged. They're doing it completely free. There's no, there's no one looking at them. There's no one looking at them. You know why? Because more than likely they, they donate to Eric Adams campaign. That's why. Is the screen coming up here? When I, when I change from mute to unmute, did the screen pop up? No. Okay, good. So I, I, I'm glad that you mentioned this, right? So I, I like to now just switch gears because I think this case is the pinnacle case. And this case is actually reflective of what's going on with the NYPD and why you and I have been such advocates to advise intrusive police work right now. And who's doing the intrusive police work right now in the New York City Police Department? to avoid doing these vehicle pursuits because ultimately all it's going to end up is liability on your own freedom, financial freedom, civil liability, and ultimately incarceration. This police officer in Newark, his last name is Crespo. He was involved in a wild police chase that ended up in a shootout. This could happen to any police officer. Did it end up in tragedy? Absolutely. Anytime there's loss of life is tragedy. But this was a wild police chase, and we're not holding the other parties accountable. And now this police officer, shortly after Donald Trump was, was, was convicted, this police officer was sentenced. I do believe the timing is impeccable. But again, this comes back to what is the standard? The standard is now if you're on the conservative side of, of the law. If you're on those side of politics, you are held to a different standard. So this police officer in Newark, which has the same democratic ideology, democratic city, is sentenced to 27 years for doing his job. What do you think about that? Shows It just shows that law enforcement is not a viable career in blue states. And I've been saying it. So have you, Eric. I've been saying it over and over again. And, and you know what? The, the truth of it, it hasn't been for a very long time. Almost over a decade. It hasn't been. Everyone I see out there now, and I see a lot of uh, men and women doing great work. Great work at these, these riots. Great work on the streets every night getting guns off the street. And I can't help but think, wow, these people are stupid. I can't help but think it. I'm sorry. I can't help but think it. I see true. people that just got promoted to captain running around put out there every night, putting their hands on people. They get in CCR beat up. They get an IAB complaints. And maybe the job's looking out for you with those IAB complaints, and they'll eventually help you with the CCRB. Maybe you're close enough to the upper echelon that they will. But there's going to come a time when something's going to happen, and they're going to completely turn their back on you. And to me, I think that you're risking your freedom, you're risking your mental, physical health, and you're f risking your financial security by continuing to be on this. I mean, look at the case. They, they see a man with a firearm, two men with a firearm in a car, they flee. Now it's a very dangerous situation. We just had police officer, uh, excuse me, detective first grade Jonathan Dillard murdered for doing a vehicle stop, right? We had Russell Timonchenko 
murdered. Then now these people did not know that there was a gun in that car. That individual, though uh, Giovanni Crespo knew there was a gun in the car. He knew they were fleeing at any time. Shots could stop firing to say that Giovanni Crespo did not reasonably fear for uh, did not fear death or serious physical injury in that situation, which is what you need in order to deploy deadly physical force is an absolute lie. Anyone in their right mind, in their right frame of mind, fears death or serious physical injury in that situation. I think even if you want to say that he acted inappropriately or there was more that he could have done to sentence this man to 27 years in jail is a complete utter travesty this does not help public safety whatsoever at all putting the giovanni crespo in jail or putting donald trump in jail does not ensure public safety for anybody well it actually does the quite opposite i think with the case of crespo we have to look at this and say to ourselves What's going on with police work in the entire country? Because here's a police officer that's doing his job. He went to work that day. He didn't say, you know what? I'm going to kill somebody today. But he went to work, and he did intrusive police work. And he did what he was paid and trained to do. And we see it throughout the entire country right now, especially in the NYPD. I can't speak for Newark, but I can speak for the NYPD, where the leadership is telling the police officers to engage in these pursuits. Because that's now a crime tactic. And I assume Newark is very in close proximity to New, uh, to New York. We probably have the same ideology. Here, Crespo was engaged in a vehicle pursuit. was a wild police chase. And exactly that. There's already knowledge that there is a firearm involved in this case. This police officer acted. You Again, I, I believe he acted appropriately. I looked at this case, but if you say that there were some facets to this case where he acted inappropriate, maybe there were some administrative errors or it violated certain policies, but I don't see how he violated the law. He did his job. He's in a volatile situation, violent situation also, and easily that firearm in that car could be used against him. So I, I, I just can't believe that we got to this point that he sentenced to 27 years that we could actually say, because in order for someone to be convicted of such a case, we have to say... Ultimately, what's the most important thing when it comes to a case like this is culpability. What is culpability? Mindset. We have to say that he had the mindset, that he had the intent to kill, right? Which we're not saying. We're saying he's a police officer involved in intrusive police work, and he had the right to overcome aggression. He had the right to protect himself and to protect the public because when he protects himself, that's reflective of the public. And that's why we have been so expressive and adamant to advise the New York City Police Department, who's doing intrusive police work, to stop engaging in these in these vehicle pursuits. It was never attacked that was supported, and especially now. Now it's no longer just civil liability. Now it's incarceration, and it's not six months, 27 years. You are giving up your entire life for a vehicle pursuit. And yes, if you're wearing tan pants, John Shell and Kaz Daughtry, they'll step in, they'll protect you as much as they can. But at some point, what is their line? We talk about lines. We talk about boundaries. What is their line? How far will they go? Will they put their own jobs on the line to protect you? I doubt it. I, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm literally at a loss for what 27 years for firing three shots at two men. Uh, he killed one. He injured another. All three shots hit. Um, I don't think that's excessive at all, especially when you're fearing for your life and you're fearing for your safety and for the life of others and the safety of others. I don't think three shots is a lot at all. I think most people in shootings would would attest to that, that they probably would have let their entire round go, the entire magazine they would have dumped without even knowing they did it uh, in an adrenaline dump. Um, to say that this was premeditated, to say that he had the intent of killing, it's absolutely wild. And how do you go out there at, at any time with a clear head now and, and chase a firearm? You know, to me, it's insane. Last month, we saw the NYPD chase two cars where they actually killed the cars that they were pursuing, killed innocent people on the streets, which is something that I said that we should not be doing in New York City with the density. You know, even at any time of the day, you really should not be pursuing vehicles unless it's an extreme, extreme emergency, act of terror, actively shooting, a murder, uh, kidnapping. Other than those times, 
we should not be chasing for fake plates, whatever they call them now, ghost cars, whatever. They give everything fancy names, and yet they all still exist, everything. Absolutely insane. And, and what do we see? Everybody that's 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 arrested for a misdemeanor or a felony, their case either gets dumbed down to an absolute violation or it gets thrown out, except if you're a conservative, except if your name's Donald Trump, except if you're a police officer. And again, I just want to go back on Stephen Lee. Six months for a misdemeanor assault, a punch in the face. Six months in jail without ever being arrested for a violent felony prior to that. Six months for a punch in the face. That could be absolutely any one of you on duty, off duty. It doesn't matter if you like Stephen Lee, if you don't like Stephen Lee. Stephen Lee is you. You are Stephen Lee. If you don't like Eric, if you don't like me, it doesn't matter. You, for the rest of your life, if you work for the NYPD or you work for any police organization, whatever you do, you'll either be retired, former, or ex, whatever agency you work for. And that stigma is never, ever leaving you. You know, it's funny. We talk, We had an episode. We talk about this all the time, right? Versus in the police department, do you take an oath or do you take omerita? And you know what? In some ways, when you join the New York City Police Department, I think it's reflective that you join the mafia because you can never lose the label. It will always be attached to you. Again, as you said, when you leave, when you leave the New York City Police Department, you will forever have an attachment. If it's 30, 40, 30, or 40 some odd years past your retirement, past your end of service with the police department, and God forbid you're in some type of pickle, you will be revered as former police officer, retired police officer. You would never lose that label. So it, it's it's quite interesting in, in the Stephen Lee case. I think that it's just so egregious as a special operations lieutenant, anti-crime sergeant, active cop, working in the New York City Police Department almost 20 years. I've seen the most violent perpetrators with felony records commit misdemeanor assaults and never receive six months themselves. So six months is co just completely egregious. Again, it goes back to what we said. What is the standard of justice? No longer is there a standard of justice. It's, it's well, if you're politically conservative or you have what's viewed as conservative ideology, you're on that side of the law, this is the arm of justice for you. If you're on the other side, this leftist ideology or you're part of the criminal first society, you will be treated with kick gloves. Uh, it's, you know, it, you know what? We we need rehab. We need a social program. But if you're Stephen Lee, you'll spend six months in jail, and you'll be treated like a savage animal. Absolutely. An article came out uh, after we did the last episode that he was placed in protective custody, but he was next to Diller's killer. And he was next to a drug dealer who chopped off the head of one of the Bloods gang members uh, or the or the head of the blood, something crazy like that. I mean, so imagine being a cop in jail. Um, I feel terrible for him. I spoke to him on the phone. We were going to set up a podcast, but we didn't. I looked into the rules and regulations. If you record at video conferencing, then I wouldn't be able to speak with him for 45 days, which doesn't matter if he speaks to me or not. But he wouldn't be able to speak to anybody for 90 days. And I, I, you know, so I advised him. I don't think it's a good idea. He wouldn't be able to contact his wife and his kid. He has a three-year-old autistic kid at home. Uh, his wife's by herself. So if anybody could do anything to help Stephen Lee, even if you just send him a book, a note, I mean, just some positivity, just so he feels like he's not by himself. Again, I don't care if you like him or you don't like him. I, I, I really, it, to me, it doesn't matter. I think I think we're watching the justice system turn on its head. We're watching it completely turn on its head in New York City. I said it during 2020 that this was a Marxist takeover of New York. Everybody looked at me like I had 10 heads. I never backed off of it. This is a Marxist takeover of New York. You're seeing it. Absolutely. You're seeing it now. Let's move on to uh, Dr. Phil. So Dr. Phil wrote around... Did a police ride along with Kaz Daughtry and John Shell, of course, the uh, the main actors of every show when it comes to New York City Police Department, the celebrities of the New York City Police Department who enjoy the photo ops. So Dr. Phil had a discussion with the uh, some of the members of the community response team, the 
the illustrious dream team that are in tan pants. He rode around with some of them, with John Shell and Kaz Daughtry. And what was quite interesting, it seems pretty much rehearsed to me, there was a detective, and he spoke uh, during an interview. With, they had a, sort of like a roundtable. It was a couple of a couple of members of the community response team. It looked like a whole team worth, and uh, Dr. Phil. And uh, I, I pretty much feel that this particular detective and also this entire uh, team at this point were speaking to this podcast. Because they use terminology that I, I normally don't hear from them. And he said, this administration takes care of us. And I said, that's funny because I, I never heard cops, especially when I was on the job in almost 20 years, I never heard cops refer to it as this administration. And that's something that we use and it's something that actually this administration has been using in correlation, having this going back and forth subliminal conversation between Kaz Daughtry, the mayor, John Shell, and, and this podcast. And what was quite interesting about that is then Kaz Daughtry was driving. He was, of course, he was the one driving Dr. Phil. He's getting all the, the, the video time and the, the photo ops. And he said, did you hear what that detective said? He said, this administration takes care of them. We take care of them. What are your thoughts on it? What are your thoughts about this administration taking care of the cops? First of all, our kid probably believes that. I hear that there's a lot of PlayStation headsets laying all over wherever the tan pants are. I hear there's a <laughs> nice private Call of Duty group that I still trying to get into, bro, run by Kaz Daughtry. I'm sure that you guys let him win, right? Because I don't think he has the ego to actually lose a Call of Duty match. So I'm sure he's the best player of all of you. You're all like you're all like little Stalin's puppets. Don't don't be the last person to stop clapping. Don't be the first person to stop clapping. Clap to the end. Let let Kaz win. <laughs> Right. So you guys are playing PlayStation at work. You're getting a ton of overtime. You're stepping on people's heads and only getting modified when other people are uh, getting suspended for minor infractions. You're getting overtime the whole time. You know, you're being looked out by for the DAs, for CCRB, for all those other things. So I think that this administration does take care of some of the people, but the overwhelming majority of NYPD. This administration is an absolute disgrace. This administration has overseen the most amount of cops leave the NYPD before they hit their 20 years than any other in history. Why is that? Why is that? If this administration is so good, if the NYPD is doing so great, why under Eric Adams has more cops left the NYPD than any other time in history other than when there were mass layoffs? Why is that? Why is that if this administration, if this administration supports people, that means that Eric Adams supports people. And if Eric Adams supports people, then why are there books with David Banks, the school chancellor, who's Phil Banks' brother? Why are there books that are anti-police, anti-parent books being given to children in New York City public schools? Why are there books teaching them that the police department enforces terrible laws and goes after and oppresses people why are there books being given out to school children that's approved under the eric adams administration that is going to further move this abolish the police ideology this administration is disgusting they're corrupt they're inept they're egotistical and honestly honestly they completely utterly failed they fail on every level of everything they do. This is an epic fail on all different angles and different aspects of, of New York City. When it comes to our children, when it comes to ourselves, when it comes to employment. But unfortunately, I do believe that these police officers in particular, the Dream Team, the Tan Pants, I believe that they're short-sighted. And it, it, what appears to be is very self-serving for this actual team. Because, yes, for this detective, if you have an opportunity to watch this, I don't know you personally. Listen, I'm happy you're out there doing intrusive police work. I know it's a hard job. You're doing quasi-anti-crime work. John and I both did anti-crime for the majority of our careers. So we have a great understanding of what you're doing out there. And we understand that you should get all the amenities afforded to you for doing that type of intrusive police work. However, what about the rest of the police department? It's obvious it's become a two-tiered system right now within the New York City Police Department. If you're in tan pants or everyone else. Because in tan pants, yes, they stick up for you. Instead of getting suspended, you get modified when you're in a, uh, a critical incident. When you're involved in vehicle pursuits and the DA may be looking at you 
Well, there's definitely a barrier between the DA and yourselves. It's obvious that John Shell and Kaz Daughtry and Mayor Eric Adams have stepped in and had your, uh, and had your back on their behalf. Why? Because this is their baby. Do you think it's really about you? This has been their baby, and this is their their uh, this is their path to success. When they talk about prosperity, and when they talk about this new version of doing anti crime, you are it. You are it. You're the test case. So, also, is there a barrier between them and you when it comes to the CCRB? Obviously, you've had a legal team that's worked around you. You've had all tools, different tools and resources that the rest of the police department doesn't have. All these things that have been afforded to you. So, yes, you are taking care of this administration. But are you asking yourself, what about your brothers and sisters that are out there in boom pants that are on the fence of deciding, should I stay on this job or should I seek other employment? Because this administration does not take care of me. But all, there's this team in itself is only looking out for just the dream team and not looking out for everyone else. And you have to ask yourself, will you be in tan pants for the rest of your career? Obviously not. Hopefully you have aspirations and you're ambitious to move on to a detective squad or some other illustrious unit, illustrious unit. And eventually this administration will not be there anymore and you will no longer be in tan pants. And how will you be viewed then? Because when you didn't stick up for your brothers and sisters while they're being attacked and they're being held to a different stand than you are. No, well, I'm sure there's they look at a lot of the people as do nothings. I'm sure they look at most of the job as do nothings. We're different. And that was what the organization built. That's why they gave them a completely different uniform. Look, you guys get to wear this cool uniform. And the other guys, those guys are do nothings. But when you look at these kids, they're so young on the job. And you look at them. Who was your daddy? Who was your father? What quota did you fill? Were you a woman? Are you black? Are you Spanish? Who was your father? Who are you related to? Who do you hang out with after work? None of you's got there by your own merit. Come on. Let's 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 call it what it is. You're not you're not evaluating a cop with 6 months or a year on the job and saying, "Yeah, this kid's awesome. We're going to we're going to put this kid in this." No, he didn't even he didn't even get his feet wet yet. He doesn't even understand who he is. You don't even understand the police officer that he is at that moment in time. And most of them are going in that unit with minimal minimal arrest activity, like laughable arrest activity. Impact zones blew out their, their arrest activity, but they're going in there not because of talent, because of who they know, you know? So I think the whole thing's a joke. Oh, they take care of me. I hope you get promoted too. Just like I, I prayed that uh for, for Tariq Shepard. And look, that worked out wonders for him. All he had to do was say how great Alvin Bragg was. And look, man, he got promoted. He, he blew past the rank of chief. So, uh, I don't know. Good luck to you guys. This administration supports you. Good luck. Yeah, it's quite interesting right there. I, listen, I thought it was hilarious. You know, they have this interview, this roundtable with Dr. Phil, and of course it was focused around the Dream Team, but who was it mostly focused around? Kaz Daughtry. Kaz and John Shell. Who was driving the car? I mean, you know what, Kaz? You know what real leaders do? Say, listen, let me give this to the troops. Have one of the guys that, that's out there and doing the job drive Dr. Phil. Let him talk to one of the, the troops that their boots were actually on the ground. But no, you had to steal the show. You had to have the photo op for your moment. You had to spend time with Dr. Phil. It was about you. And of course, John Shell is in the same car. But what's quite interesting to me also, what's quite interesting also with this, isn't Kaz Daughtry a civilian member of the service? Because he sure does a lot of enforcement stuff. I, I don't understand. It, it is completely new ideology. You know, if he is involved in um, this, I'm curious about this. I'm not trying to go completely off topic, but if he is ever involved in some type of critical incident or some pickle with the police department, what type of indemnification will he get? Because he's a, he's a civilian member of the service. He shouldn't even be in an enforcement aspect of the job. He shouldn't be doing enforcement as we speak. Dude, he's going to get indemnified even if he sexually assaults somebody off duty like the rest of Eric Adams friends. I mean, this is a joke that, like I said, this is the most corrupt administration we've ever had. They're going to get indemnification. But the cop that threw a cooler at somebody, he's not getting indemnification. Juan Perez isn't getting indemnification. The next guy that gets into an on duty incident or is attacked by a perpetrator off duty, he's not getting indemnification. Kaz Daughtry shouldn't even be carrying a gun at this point. He should have need a license. He should be a civilian member of service. He shouldn't even be carrying a gun. He runs around with a gun on his hip. He's taking enforcement action. He's getting indemnification because you know what? 
when you look at Eric Adams getting indemnification for a 19 whatever 90s or 86 incident when he was off duty and he's getting indemnified just because he worked for the police department. He's being accused of a sexual assault. And now when the lady pushes back because Sal Greco says, I want the letter on the reasonings why you're indemnifying him. When she pushes back, what happens to her? She gets fired, right? Now we have a new head of corporation counsel. Of course he's getting indemnified. Absolutely, absolutely uh, ridiculous. Listen, last thing before we run, Boston mayor. Boston mayor is going to do two things. She thinks that it's been working out so great. This is in 2019. This is in 2018. This isn't cool anymore. So, But this is what she wants to do. She wants to stop prosecuting shoplifters, and she wants to make police officers' records public, just like they did in the NYPD, what we know as 50A, they were, they they brought they they uh whatever they did they repealed 50A which protected officers disciplinary records they repealed that so now in Boston they want I don't know what it's called there but they want to do the same exact thing make disciplinary what are your thoughts about those two things Eric? Well, it's obvious that the uh, mayor will along with all the Democratic mayors of of this entire country are definitely convening together and they're all in, in uh. They're all in cahoots together to have this Marxist ideology when it comes to policing. And they're all part of this defund the police movement and ultimately abolish the police. And how are they going to do that? Tear down the boots on the ground, tear down the public records of police officers. We talk about transparency. It's, the only transparency there is is accountability for police officers. This ideology to put the public record out for Boston police is going to diminish their police department. Hopefully the Boston police officers see that this is absolutely this is absolutely going to deteriorate their career their records and ultimately their lives because once this is public you could tear it down you could look at this when you're on duty off duty on the job in retirement post your life in, in, in law enforcement and that public record will always be there i think this, this is an abomination and this is only going to lead to further crime in boston and again just goes down to the downfall of the democratic cities in this entire country because of political ideology and all these mayors are in this political arena together and what's interesting about this it's not a black mayor and what mayor eric adams likes to say it's democratic mayors it's those that are in this political ideology mayor Wu, mayor eric adams the mayor of chicago they all have the same ideology it's the criminal first society let's tear down law enforcement let's tear down what's common sense let's destroy the lives of police officers because they're the monsters and let's protect the criminals let's not arrest them for theft Let's only arrest police officers like Stephen Lee and spend six months in jail. That's it. That's the standard. Yeah, I forget destroying the lives of police officers. You're destroying everyone in that city's life. You're destroying the ecosystem of a city, right? I mean, we. I mean, if you're looking for data, you're looking for data. We have Chicago. We have L.A. We have New York. They stopped prosecuting for shoplifting. Was that good? Did that did that ensure public safety? No. What happened? Businesses are closing. Old people can't go to pharmacies. The pharmacies are leaving neighborhoods. There's less jobs. There's less growth. There's more crime. There's more good families that are paying taxes that are law-abiding citizens leaving your city. So to me at this point, if you're going to do this now, four years after the progressives have taken hold of every blue city in New York City, you're intentionally trying to destroy your own city the people of boston should stand up i didn't hear a word from the boston pba i didn't hear a word from the administration of the boston police department i didn't hear a word from anybody because again i got kids i got this i got that it's an absolute disgrace and the same thing goes for that repeal of 50a we were told that transparency matters it's going to make for better public safety if people see police officers record and to date I did believe that happened four years ago. Andrew Cuomo signed it into law. What is one example of how that improved the lives of New Yorkers by, by making uh, police officers disciplinary records permanent? Permanent, by the way, because even in death or retirement, your record stays on the books while we're expunging the criminal records of people in New York. That you, But your disciplinary record, you got a CD for wearing white socks. People know that 100 years into history. Congratulations, fellas. Your name's going down in history. It's funny you say that because we always heard in life, right? There's two, there's only two, there's only two things that are guaranteed, right? Is that you will pay taxes and you will seek death. 
But now if you're a police officer, there's a third guarantee. And that guarantee is that your public record will remain. And that will be exposure for you for your entire career and your entire life. Forever. If someone just Googles your name, if they Google Eric Dim right now, they're going to see most complaint cop. They're going to see uh, my public record without any context. And you're going to be viewed by that for potential future employment. If you're single, if you're out there in the dating world, someone's going to see that and say, well, this is not a man or woman that I want to date because you're going to perceive as some type of monster because of your public record. You know, this is this is quite interesting. Again, I'm gl so glad that you said that this is intentional because I was thinking the same thing. If you were a mayor of your own city in L.A., New York, Chicago, Boston, let's talk about L.A. and New York because this is the most prevalent where you see it. It's costing people a substantial amount of money. The inconvenience, the amount that it's costing the everyday citizen just to go to a Walgreens, a CVS, a Rite Aid. If you go to a supermarket, it's almost like you go into a fortress that you have to pay extra money because now if you want to get shampoo, you have to go to an area that's completely locked. You have to press a button, a call button to wait for a customer service employee to attend, to open that lock, to get you your item. That takes a substantial amount of time. So that person has to be paid more money. Your time is inconvenient. You're paying more money for that item. It's locked up. Now you have to have private security. All the facets that surround this, it costs more money on the everyday citizen, and it's a complete inconvenience. And if you're a mayor of one of these cities, it's very easy. Just walk into one of your Walgreens, walk into one of your Rite Aids, your CVS, and see what's going on there and see – that it's just complete fortress and it's a, a miserable experience to shop to buy things because everything is under lock and key because we don't want to arrest people for theft. Dude, go to the CVS by one police plaza. Everything's locked up. You, like, think of that. Like, everyone's like, oh, how do you live in Florida, bro? I'm like, how do I live in Florida? Very easy. I walk into Walgreens. If I want a bottle of water, I get it. If I want razor blades, I get it. I don't have to ring a bell and wait for anyone. I just get it, and I bring it to the counter like I always did in America. But, you know, I, I, I got in a little tiff with Kyle Serafin the other day, and he's like, John, you don't understand. You didn't live in America. You lived in New York City. And I was like, you know what? He's got a point. He's got a good point. Like I, he's a hundred percent right. I didn't, I didn't live in America, and I didn't police in America either. The things that that we that are should be societal norms are are no longer normal. And everyone that lives there is like, nah, it's fine, bro. You just ring the bell. Just wait two hours for the guy who doesn't want to do his job to to come here and get me what I need. So every it's a complete utter inconvenience. Oh, and then when you go up, by the way, you can't even get a bag. You can't even get a bag. They don't give you bags because bags kill the environment. Don't get a plastic straw either, but don't worry. We're going to give you paper straws that have forever products in them that are going to stay in your lungs and your bloodstream for the entirety of your life. But we're doing it for your safety, of course. Everything for your safety. Mayo Wu, another complete failure. Another absolute complete failure. You have four years of data where you're seeing cities being destroyed by moving away from broken windows and she's moving towards it after all of it. So, I mean, I don't know. Keep it going. Keep, keep staying silent. Keep not doing anything. Keep not talking to your politicians. Keep whatever. Keep just saying me and Eric are assholes. It's fine. It's fine. Everything's going to be good. Your life's going to be better. Your pension's going to be there forever. Kaz Daughtry is going to place you all with drones. He's going to replace every one of you with drones because he's already clapping up and down that the Denver Police Department is now sending drones to respond to 911 calls. And he tweeted, this is the future. So guess what happens when we have drones instead of people? Pension system that, by the way, Brad Lander is completely destroying. He's losing billions every year. It won't be there because you need the other cops to, to supply it. So you won't have a pension. But don't worry. Kaz Daughtry was a good guy. He took care of you. John Shell was a great guy. You know, Kaz's driver. And that's it. And they were all good. And you got to wear cool tan pants. But you won't have a pension. And neither will the rest of us. And you'll be like, wow, those two guys, you know, they weren't that bad. You're talking about broken windows. And I'm going to end on this. Now it's a broken system. The entire system is broken when it comes to these democratic cities towards policing. And Kaz Daughtry is so inept and so inadequate and so in immature and obviously a complete moron and doesn't understand that that tweet that he put out is actually supporting the defund the police movement. When you say that the drones are our future instead of actual boots on the ground, the human element to policing, what you're saying is that you support the defund the police movement. You're replacing your police officers that need a that need a salary, that are seeking out a pension, that support their families, you're supporting their replacement by 
artificial intelligence by this technology because you're not either you're just inadequate and you're uh, you're too stupid to even realize what's going on and you're not thinking about it, or you're just so concerned with these photo ops and and clicks and that you're more concerned with being the celebrity on Instagram, social media, with Dr. Phil, that you're not actually seeing the big picture big picture, which is why you should not be in leadership. So again, I say to that detective in the community response team wearing tan pants, this administration looks out for you, you're very short-sighted because guess what? If eventually they start replacing everyone with drones and that includes you, there's no one to pay in that pension system and you will be broke too. So I think again, is this administration the one that you want to work for? Does this one have your back? I think not. And with that, I'll land there. I just want to end on one thing, Kaz. I know you're listening to this, John Shell. I know you're listening to this. The rest of the Chiefs that are listening to this, I want the ability to be able to comment on your posts. All right, I pay taxes in New York City. I want the ability. There's no reason that the public is able to comment, and I'm not. I want the ability to comment on your post. Remove it from me immediately. And if you don't, you'll see my name on something else. Okay. I want the ability and I need the ability. That's transparency. That's leadership. I don't come at you. I, I give fact-based statements. I ask questions. You attempting to cut out my tongue only proves everything that I say correct. That's all you do and it proves you to be a coward. And everybody sees it. Make sure that I'm able to comment. I'm with you, brother. Absolutely. Absolutely. At this point, we should be able to comment. And, and well, listen, you have had the opportunity. You tried to make a personal account. You have the opportunity to block us on that. But this is this is a public account. This is your account from the New York City Police Department. We will be making comments soon, or the next comment we will make will be on a different piece of paper. Thank you very much. Law enforcement professionals dedicate their lives to serving and protecting our community. But who's protecting their financial futures? That's where Laidlaw Blue comes in. Our wealth management platform is specifically designed for the law enforcement community. Laidlaw Blue is a division within Laidlaw Wealth Management run by retired New York City detective John McDermott. His status as a retired detective uniquely positions him to establish a deep connection between Laidlaw Blue and the law enforcement community. Our platform is easy to use and provides a range of financial services, including investment management, retirement planning, and insurance solutions. With Laidlaw Blue, you can secure your financial future and provide for your loved ones. Our team of experienced financial advisors understands the unique challenges and opportunities that law enforcement professionals face. We're here to help you navigate the complexities of financial planning, and achieve your goals. Laidlaw Blue, secure your financial future today. Book a meeting using the QR code displayed or call us directly on 888-901-BLUE. That's 888-901-BLUE.